Um, so hi everyone, um, my name is Emma Johansson or Emma Johansson and I work as the creative director of a game studio called Runaway Play which is based in Dunedin in New Zealand, Aotearoa and that means that I'm in a different time zone from you all right now. Uh, here it's Thursday morning at uh, the 17th of December uh, so I'm actually uh, in the future which is pretty cool. Uh, but yeah, it's super early here. Uh, I've just had my uh, first morning coffee, so bear with me as I wake up. <clears throat> as you all get more tired this evening, I will get more awake. Uh, so I think we'll be kind of perfectly in sync, probably just after I finish this talk, which is great because then it's time for that uh, speed dating session. Um, I'm really excited to be here talking to you all today. Uh, this year, as you all know, have sucked in so many ways um, because of the pandemic. However, I'm really glad that um, you had to host this year's Alumni Night uh, online because that meant that I could finally participate. And tonight I'm going to talk about um, what I've done since I graduated. And I was going to share my top 10 lessons learned, um, but I actually ended up only with seven lessons um, because that's what happens when you write the blurb about your talk before you actually write the talk. Um, so, welcome to my talk at the top seven lessons I've learned from working in the games industry for over a decade. And before I start focusing on talking too much about myself and my experiences, uh, I quickly want to talk a little bit about Runaway Play so that you can get an idea uh, of the company I work for. I moved as far away as I possibly could uh, to New Zealand to join Runaway. So I've been with the studio since it's formed and uh, I've worked as an artist and game designer on almost all of our games. And Runaway's key point of difference within the gaming market is that we make games inspired by the natural world. And lucky for us, the natural world is super weird, so we can draw on this wealth of inspiration and deliver really fun concepts. So I will now share a company trailer. I'm not really sure how this audio will go, but we'll see. that worked for everyone um, I, I put that trailer together and I found the music for free online from an album called inspirational corporate music and I thought that was really funny but I can recommend that album if you need um, free music for anything in the future um, so anyway um, so at Runaway we have currently five live free-to-play games uh, for instance cat cafe flood of butterfly sanctuary for the Starlight, Splash Ocean Sanctuary, and Bird b, &B. Our games are not wildly popular in Sweden. If anyone has played any of our games, please come talk to me afterwards. Um, one time, I know we were featured on the Swedish App Store in a category called the best games you've never heard about, uh, which I thought was yeah, pretty funny. Um, but we have uh, around half a million monthly players. Uh, so yeah, not as massive as King, but uh, big enough to uh, sustain our studio and be profitable. Uh, and most of our uh, users are based in the US. Um, we would define our genre of games as <clears throat> wholesome collection nurture games that focus on innovative game design, 
high long-term retention, and is for an inclusive audience. Our target demographic is what we would call um, passive non-gamers. Uh, so mobile free-to-play is the perfect uh, business model for us, making diverse and inclusive games because of its accessibility. And the fact that our games are free allows us to reach a broader um, and therefore more diverse audience. <clears throat> so our games monetization is in a purchase focused. Uh, we see our games as a service and the development of our games is an ongoing collaboration uh, together with our fans. So it's important for us that our players feel safe to spend their money in our games. So we design monetization mechanics that feel fair uh, to the audience. We add ongoing uh, updates to our game with new content, as well as monthly limited time events. Um, and after each event, uh, we listen to our players' reactions and we take those learnings into the next. I'm very proud of our company's culture. And uh, we are now 30 people working in our studio. And we believe that a healthy work-life balance and having fun at work is a great way to boost creativity and create innovation. We do a lot of fun things like game design club, which is like a book club, but for playing games. And um, we do game day of fashion week, which is just an excuse to dress um, like the Met Gala at work. And we do things like lunchtime GDC, which is just watching GDC talks and discussing them during lunch. And diversity is also one of Runaway's core values. Um, our staff is close to <clears throat> evenly split between men and women with employees from 10 different countries. And we know that that's not the norm and that the game industry is currently pretty underrepresented when it comes to women. I think the stats say that uh, women only make up 22% of the game industry itself. And I think it's even worse in New Zealand with something like 18%. So in 2018, we started a campaign, Girls Behind the Games, uh, where we started to share uh, women's success stories in the industry in order to inspire others uh, to seek out roles in this field. <clears throat> So we kickstarted that campaign um, as the New Zealand Prime Minister Jacinda Ardern visited our studio. So she helped spread the campaign. And we had over 5 million tweet impressions through Girls Behind Games. This was thanks to like hundreds of women um, across the globe um, sharing their experience and talent. And this was a really cool time and one of my personal highlights. So that was uh, a little bit about the company where I work. And now you might all think, but Emma, how did you get to work at such a cool place? <laughs> but um, I will tell you all about that. Um, but I will start with rewinding the time and, and give you some important background information about myself. So I was born in <clears throat> Linköping in Sweden and growing up I played a lot of games. My first console being the NES or Super Famicom system and then when I turned 11 PlayStation came out and my twin brother and I got one for our birthday and I remember that as one of the best moments of my childhood. When I turned 12 and um, my family bought um, our first computer I was already then really into computers and I was frequently using them at the local library where you could rent a computer for free for an hour at a time. And I was mainly playing strange uh, educational games uh, because of the library's limited options. And I was also a massive user of MS Paint. Um, and I spent a lot of time chatting with creepy guys on the internet and it was a lot of fun. When I <clears throat> got um, a computer at home and um, it meant that I was really free uh, from the time limits and I can download all the games I really wanted to play. So in my younger years I was um, a classical um, computer nerd. When I grew uh, a little bit older my world was blown away when I realized I could combine my gaming interests together with my interests of chatting to creepy guys by playing MMOs. 
So I spent um, a lot of time in this game called Tibia, which kind of looks similar to uh, this program we're all using right now. And a few years after that, I started playing World of Warcraft. Um, so I was 20 years old when I decided to combine my passion for drawing fi Disney fan art uh, with my World of Warcraft addiction um, and become a game designer. So in 2006, I started studying game design and art at the University of Gotland. Um, so here's a picture of me and my classmates. Uh, you can try and find me in this image. Um, uh, I also think maybe that Ulf is in this picture as well. Uh, and maybe there's a few people in this audience that will recognize themselves. I think we were allowed to have weapons with our ninja costumes. I don't know if you still do that here, um, but I think having weapons were banned um, after our year. Um, but during my time, um, during my time uh, studying the subjects I enjoyed the most most was the project based ones um, like the big game project and it sounds like you still have that one now <clears throat> i really love the process of creating an idea making a drawing and then give it life when putting it into a game and it was that process that made me really fall in love with game development when i was a student i had a lot of worries about not getting a job and I wanted to prepare myself in my portfolio in order to optimize my chances of getting one. People often advised me to focus more on specific parts of game development. Like maybe I should work on my 3D portfolio because it's more jobs out there for specifically 3D artists. decided to be a designer or an artist and that it would be easier to get a job if I was more specific in what I wanted to do. But I never had a good answer on those questions because I wanted to do everything. I liked the whole process of creating games and I couldn't just pick one. So I ended up focusing on a little bit of everything So <clears throat> because that's what I enjoyed the most. And I included all of that in my portfolio. When I, when I graduated in 2009, um, I did apply for a few different jobs. Um, some of them I didn't get because my portfolio didn't have enough 3D work in it or it was not clearly focused enough. But later that year, I was introduced to Tim Nixon, who was a co-founder of Runaway Play. And they were looking for an artist to join the team while working on a game about butterflies. During my interview with them, I expressed that even though the position I was offered was as an artist, that I also have lots of passion towards game design. And I ended up getting that job. And later he told me that it was because I expressed the interest I had in both art and design that they ended up choosing me. And back then Runaway was just a small team and they needed people with multiple skills. My choice of not focusing on what necessarily made the most sense in terms of getting any job was the one thing that ended up helping me getting this job. And this job is a lot of fun, and that's why I stayed with that company for 11 years. So my lesson number one uh, is uh, do what you find the most fun. Doing what you find the most fun will also <clears throat> be the one thing that you will find easiest to get good at. I decided to become a game developer because I loved playing games. And when I learned how to make them, I chose the career path within that that I thought was the most fun. And I believe most of you all have already done the first part of choosing a career you'll find fun. So I encourage you all to think about what part of game development you enjoy the most and then focus more on that. So 
I got a job in New Zealand and I was relocated to Dunedin to work on Runaway's first title, which was Flutter Facebook. So Facebook games uh, was a really big thing back in the day. Um, maybe you remember games like Farmwell. Um, but this is um, a screen grab of what uh, Flutter Facebook looked like. During the first years, um, with working with Runaway, we didn't have any type of leadership structure. We were a small team that shared a cr creative vision, which meant we were all responsible for the end result of our games. Even if working like this was a fun and exciting and sometimes resulted in some innovative and interesting game mechanics, this um, structure still had its flaws. What should have been one unified vision often turned into several different creative visions. So in order to come to any agreement, um, a lot of things ended up being a compromise. Because everyone was allowed to give feedback, it was hard to know when a task was finished. Um, this created uncertainty and we often ended up redoing things over and over again as it didn't gel with everyone's vision. An example of this was that uh, I ended up having to redo the full set of art for um, Flutter Facebook multiple times. Um, and I have a few examples of that here. There we go. Bam, bam, bam. So many drawings, We're doing everything, taking a lot of time. <clears throat> so, I was going back and forth for what felt like forever until we ended up with a result we all liked. And this may work well if you have all the time in the world, but if you're on a tight deadline, um, this is not ideal. Because I didn't have a clear process of telling if or when um, a task was done, I often uh, cause both stress and frustration. Uh, so those, those are all me. Um, and I learned that it was extremely hard to be creative if you're stressed and the art also suffered from it. This structure was meant to give me a feeling of ownership and influence, but it had the opposite effect because I ended up just trying to figure out exactly what everybody else wanted. At this point, we were just not ready or experienced enough to have an open structure like this. And we realized this and decided that we needed a different structure. So we appointed Tim, um, that I mentioned before, um, to be responsible for the vision of the game. So you can see in my example, Tim there has a ribbon because he was the vision holder of the game. Um, and at Runaway, we call them product owners. Um, and I was asked to become uh, the project's lead artist and my colleague Jeff became the lead programmer. And having a clear leader for a project was the best thing we could have done. And this leads me to my second lesson. Nothing saves time uh, more time than good leadership. Um, and having that one person communicating a shared and a single vision with the team helped us see clearly what we need to focus on and what was the most important for the game. And working with that vision as a lead artist and a lead programmer meant that we uh, could debate with the product owner what was the most important in our respective fields. So instead of uh, us all giving input and caring about everything, we all ended up feeling like we had more responsibility. And when I speak to teams, um, that often get stuck um, and cannot progress in their games. It's often related back to uh, poor clarity around the vision and the leadership. So I cannot stress more how important this is, even if you are, are a really small team. In 2015, the studio became a self-publisher and we uh, doubled Runaway staff going from 10 people to 20. This might not have seemed like a huge scale up, uh, but as we now had two live games and had also just started production on a third, my focus became split and I didn't have enough time to be the lead artist for all three games. 
as we were hiring more artists, uh, someone needed to lead that whole team. So I took on the role as the studio's art director. Because of this, I started to think about what type of art director I wanted to be and what type of work environment I wanted to set up for the art team. When I re researched project structures of games and movies that I loved, I came across some really bad horror stories. I read an example where most of the staff left the company once the game was launched, and in another example where half of the staff went on sick leave once the project was finished. So I became really determined that it had to be possibly to, possible to lead a team that could produce something that others would love without making them feel miserable in the end of it. To do this, I created the R Team Vision Plan. And I started by setting up one-on-one -on -one with each team member to ask everyone what their dreams and goals for the future were. I discussed these points individually with everyone and when we discussed them, and then we discussed them together as a group. We, together we got, gathered artwork that inspired us and talked about why. We discussed what we liked about our current art and what we wanted to do better. This became the key values uh, we are still referring to today when making decisions for new art styles and when starting new projects. I spent a lot of time working on the culture of the art team and when I later became the creative director, I adopted a similar process for the companies, for the whole company culture. And directing a company or a team's culture takes a lot of time. And every time you expand or change your team or studio in any way, it needs constant maintenance, but it's super important. So my lesson number three is the key to a happy team is to create a good culture. Um, and this is something you can all think about with, with the team. What came and what's important for you as an individual and how would you and your team define success? Also, when looking for jobs, this is the first thing I would ask the company about. What is their culture like? And does that align with how you want to work? So if you're planning on starting a company yourself or become any type of leader, I would recommend to define that in the early stages. And if you're looking for a job, making sure that you pick a company that culturally aligns with you. Just gonna check what the time is to see where. Oh yeah, doing all right. <clears throat> so as I already touched on before, I'm really not a fan of being stressed, as I think it blocks uh, creativity. And when I was offered to be um, the project lead, so the product owner of our studio's first virtual reality game, uh, which was called Flutter VR, um, I was extremely nervous. This was the first uh, project uh, I was leading. And this project had an extremely short timeline, uh, only nine months. Uh, and I know that sounds long because you do games in 10 weeks, which is crazy, but nine months is a fairly uh, short time frame. Um, it was also for a new platform with new technology and a medium we never designed uh, to before. We also had very strict milestone deliveries attached to the projects as it was funded externally. And if we were to fail any of the milestones, the project ran the risk of being completely canceled and before we got the project greenlit, uh, we had to go over a series of interviews and checks with the publishers in order to get the contract. And this was the first time I was the person dealing with our external partners directly. And the first time I had to represent the company in that way. And I worked so hard for this. And once the game finally got greenlit, I completely crashed and got really sick. Um, which is unfortunately not a, an uncommon thing. Um, so yeah, this was only like 
two or three weeks into the production. And I remember thinking that I probably had some type of wor world record in being burnt out the quickest in the history of product owners. Um, but since it was really early, I hadn't gone with low energy for too long and I could recover fairly quickly. It was also a good reminder for me what not to do. I had not listened to my own advice at all, and I'd gone against our cultural guidelines. And so for me, this was a real wake up call. So during the whole development of Flutter VR, I decided to always prioritize the team's well being before anything. I didn't want them to feel and go through what I've just experienced. To set myself and the team up for success, I didn't agree on any milestones I didn't think we could actually achieve. So I decided to not promise <clears throat> any exact amount of mechanics, systems, levels, or characters for any milestones. Instead, I kept it really broad. For example, our alpha milestone um, said, this milestone will deliver the final set of core mechanics, which will all be functionally complete and playable on device. So here I'm not stating any numbers, and this gives you room to change things and to cut things if you need it. So I became really good at cutting features, which is something I would recommend anyone who is looking at a career as a product owner or a producer to be good at. And what I've learned from this project was that you do not need to stress and crunch to make great games. It's only a result of bad project management. And I truly believe this. And doing this <clears throat> um, doesn't even have to compromise the game. For us being this strict um, on not doing overtime and hitting those milestones made us actually focus on what was really important for the game and the game ended up with a really clear vision because of that. And I don't think it's possible that you can manage that stress and that overwork by setting yourself and your team up for success. And the game industry have a standard of crunch that I, not every company, but across the industry is quite common. And I don't believe uh, that that's necessary to make game development even faster or better. And that the reason <laughs> that this presentation is kind of ugly is that, um, and that why this talk is maybe not as uh, cohesive and professional as I would have hoped it to be, is because I've learned from my past mistake and I decided to prioritize not to stay up the whole night and to make it better. Instead, I prioritized my health and sleep, and um, while also creating something that feels perfectly fine. So after finishing uh, the Flutter VR project, our creative director, Tim, left Runaway to work uh, for that game company, and I was asked to take over his role. During my years as Runaway, I had now worked across so many different roles as an artist, a game designer, a lead artist, an art director, a product owner, and now I became the creative director. This meant that I got the opportunity to work with everyone at Runaway, regardless of their roles. And one thing I had identified as the company had grown bigger was that there were more and more issues that was caused by miscommunication between two different groups within the studio. And I wonder if any of you can guess what two groups that would be. Uh, of course, it was between um, programmers and artists. And if I may generalize, artists are sometimes uh, more sensitive and creative minded and programs are sometimes more logical. No, this is not true for every case. And don't get me wrong, one of my favorite things about working in the games industry is that by default, it's a diverse industry where when it comes to different types of professions working together, there are not many industries where artists, programmers, and musicians are working so closely together. And 
<clears throat> but that can cause issues. A common thing we have to deal with is that sometimes programmers see artists as someone that makes their system designs look pretty. And sometimes artists think that a solid core loop and a system means nothing if they cannot emotionally connect to the character within the game. And the argument often stems from what angle we need to lead a project from. Does it start with the mechanic or the theme? And no one is right or wrong in this argument. They are both equally important for a game to be fun and successful. From my experience, this is the most common cause of conflict in game teams, but there is an easy solution and that's communication. We have a policy at Runaway that each game team needs to have one artist, one program, uh, one designer as part of the core design team. And that way, <clears throat> it means that whatever went into the game had equal weight and opinion from people with different minds. So lesson number five um, is to learn how to communicate with and understand the value in your colleagues, even when they're very different from you. And this is something I know you all have the opportunity to be great at. I think it's pretty unique for game education to so early on learn how to work together in that sense. And I think that was one of the biggest things that I benefited from the most during my years at university was working really closely together with both artists and programmers and collaborating on that design. And as a creative leader, that is what I work on facilitating at Runaway. And I believe the communication between a diverse group of people and the ability to see each other's strengths and also learn from each other is what really creates great games. <clears throat> Coming to the end. Um, <clears throat> so for the past, so I'm just gonna drink some water. I'm just gonna check that. Cool, it is all going. It's just so quiet, so. <laughs> Sorry. Um, <laughs> yeah, I was just worried that maybe I've been talking to no one for a really long time. Uh, so I just wanted to double check, but that's not the case, so that's great. Um, so yeah. <laughs> I also um, got the opportunity to be working as a product owner on my dream game. So right now we are making a game about Old Friends in Your Dog Sanctuary. So if you don't know who Old Friends in Your Dog Sanctuary is, I can tell you that they are a real retirement home for old dogs based in Mount Juliet, Tennessee, which is located just outside of Nashville. They have over 2 million online followers. So the idea of this game actually started uh, because our narrative designer, Lisa and I, were huge fans of their Facebook page. <clears throat> so Lisa and I started uh, working together on the vision for the game in November, 2018. We flew to Tennessee on a research trip and to present the vision to them in person. We got to know all the staff and we got to meet all the dogs. And they were really excited about the idea um, of us making the game. And we now have an agreement in place with the rights to make the game about them. And this is um, really exciting for, for us and for me. It's really like my dream I pay to work on. And just to put this in context, um, I believe that for me working on this game must be the equivalent of how J.J. Abrams felt when he got to work on his favorite IP, Star Trek and Star Wars. So Old Friends Senior Dog Sanctuary will be a free-to-play game about friendship for people who love dogs. And players will be able to build and run their own senior dog sanctuary where they can foster old dogs and care for them. And we want this game to feel like visiting a happy place that's safe and always happy to see you. And a core theme of the game will be to focus on the lovable nature of every dog, regardless of their age or personality. So each dog will be based on a real life resident from the sanctuary. And these dogs are like celebrities on social media and they'll all have their own stories and unique behaviors, which is something that we wanted to display within the game. So it's been a real fun project to work on, uh, but game development is always hard. 
We wanted to design the best dog game ever that also needed a core loop and enough content to entertain players for years. This is super hard to do, and we're still in production on this project. Even though this project has been very ambitious for us, um, it has been okay to try to figure this out because <clears throat> we have always had a really clear vision of where we wanted the game to end up. And this brings me to lesson number six. Um, nothing is more important than a clear vision. And I cannot stress how important this is because for this game specifically, we did so much research before even starting prototyping thing. And we had a really clear image of we how, how we wanted the game to feel when playing it. And a vision is the agreed on guiding principles for the whole project. And a vision should be designed to help you guide um, your decisions and help you make priorities when it comes to the game. A vision should never change and should be referred to regularly during the project. And before we green light any games internally at Runaway, there are three areas we define our vision for. And um, those are the game's design pillars, like what do you want the mechanics to communicate and focus on, uh, the tone of the game, how should uh, the game feel when you play it, and the target audience, which is um, and who is this game for. And if you clearly define these three things before starting uh, production, any decision you make will be so much easier. Um, yeah, so I've touched a little bit on vision on previous parts of this uh, presentation as well. But yeah, vision is the, the single most important thing you can uh, decide for a game project. And also I think it's the single thing um, that uh, can cause issues. If you don't have a clear vision, it will be really hard to complete what you're doing. And now we're at my uh, last uh, point, but also the most important one, which is lesson number seven, is to always be kind. And, and this might sound easy or simple, but after working with a lot of people in different teams for a lot of years, um, kindness is the trait I value the most. It could be an artist or a programmer or a game designer, but it's almost impossible to teach someone to be kind. And being kind also helps the team work well together. And the industry is also super small and you always meet the same people twice. So you are wise to leave a good impression on everyone you meet. So if you only take away one thing from my rant slash story slash talk today, um, it should be that being kind is the most valuable skill you can ever learn. So here's a recap of the top seven lessons I've learned from working in the games industry over a decade. <laughs> so do what you find the most fun. Nothing saves more time than good leadership. The key to a happy team is to create a good culture. You don't need to crunch to make, project, to make great games. It's only a result of bad project management. Learn how to communicate with and understand the value in your colleagues, even when they are different from you. Nothing is more important than a clear vision and always be kind. Um, yeah, thank you all for listening. Um, here's my email and Twitter if anyone wants to reach out uh, and talk to me after this. And it's time for questions. Thank you so much. That was excellent. <laughs> Great work. Um, so yeah, like before, questions Emma. line up to the left of the room and uh, ask away. How are you feeling? Have you woken up now? Yeah, I'm, I'm like pumped. <laughs> <laughs> no, that was great. That was so good. OK, cool. Thank you. <laughs> Timo. Uh, hi. Hello. <laughs> Far away. <laughs> thank you so much. Thank you so much for, for the presentation. A very like really uh, inspiring and very energetic as well. So good because it's uh, quite late here in, in Finland where I'm listening from. So <laughs> it's very very well welcome. 
to bring oh, it cool. into the mood. Uh, so I had a question. Uh, since uh, you've obviously been working on quite a few uh, different shipped games, and uh, this is uh, from from now uh, like a game design vision point of view question. Since uh, once you've shipped one game, for example, Flutter, which was the first one, how do you kind of move on from, from that to a new IP or a different kind of game? And how do you kind of start of moving to forwards in uh, developing it? Um, yeah, th that's a great question. I think uh, early on in the studio, we, um, we kind of naturally built um, the next game. We modeled it on on a game that was successful. It took the studio a while to come up with a successful game. I think the, the first successful, like financially successful game we made was uh, Flutter um, Butterfly Sanctuary for mobile. So after doing that, uh, we naturally made um, a similar version of that game called Splash. Um, and then we made another version of Flutter. So for them, we kind of built upon what we've learned and what we thought was good. I think now when the studio is is like healthy, profitable, we are adapting a different strategy to uh, creating new games, um, which is um, involving way more prototyping and actually more thought through um, ideas. The way we also work, and I know companies do this very differently, um, so I know some companies, they have like a leadership team that decides what type of games they want to do. Um, but we're in a unique position where um, we, we can self-publish our games so we can come up with our own ideas. And the way we do that now is that the whole studio is just pitching ideas that they find good. And then we have a voting process of um, the ideas that people within the studio uh, find the best. And once we've done that, we go into prototyping phase um, where we try to figure out how those uh, ideas would be played. So uh, it takes a long time, but it's a really fun process. Does that ex um, explain, or does that answer your question? Um, or it, it's just kind of, a, a, you can do it in so many different ways. I don't think there's one way of deciding what to do next. I think the, um, the, the biggest thing that we have is that our brand, we are inspired by nature or the natural world, uh, which gives a little game. We also have really clear kind of brand values of what types of games that we as a studio want to do. So um, having that clarity for everybody in the studio when we are pitching new games, it uh, just makes it really easier to actually pick what we want to do next. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So kind of like a, with like a, a framed context to look at what to do next, I guess, is what you guys do. Yeah, yeah, we look at that. We look at what's worked for us in the past and also essentially what what types of games we want to see be realized within the brand of being inspired by the natural world. Right. Uh, but we also have a really clear kind of target demographic that we're going for, so it all comes uh, back to uh, creating that really clear vision and type of game that we want to do. Right, thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, yes. Um, um, my bachelor thesis was uh, about dark game design patterns. And yeah. when you mentioned in the beginning, you're monetizing uh, a system. I wonder, like, how did you avoid some of those patterns, like pay to skip, uh, you know, all this grind? problems and I mean uh, I assume that you can't talk uh, open about your like uh, it's more like a secret of a company but maybe some small example or anything like that how to monetize during uh, we are uh, in-game purchases and not <clears throat> not to go on the dark side let's call it like that <laughs> yeah no um, totally and that that's a really important topic and um, I think a lot of free-to-play studios um, 
a lot of free to play games uh, do take advantage of dark patterns and not just games, it's like websites and everything. And the way we work with it is that we have this role where we want everyone to be able to play our games for free. So there should always be a, a free option to complete anything within the game. So when we design events, for example, we uh, tune them so that a player who uh, doesn't want to pay in the game can still complete it within the time frame. So um, that's one rule we have. And then the other things are just making sure that uh, when there is a player purchase that we have a warning, like, um, d tap again to buy this or you have warning windows popping up and, and warning the player that if you if you do this you will spend real money um, which is also really important we do the same thing for hard currency within the game even though we, we give away hard currency for free we make sure that people know that they are spending that in any of the mechanics of the game um, so those are kind of the, the, the general rules uh, we use when designing game. We just want it to feel um, really fair for the player and to no one to, to feel like they accidentally did a purchase. We have some ads in our games and we adapt the same um, policy for that. Ads should always be optional. You shouldn't have to watch an ad to play the game. So that's kind of what we do. If you're wondering more in terms of like actual um, um, game mechanics we use um, to kind of facilitate the free-to-play yeah. economy, it's, it's different for every game. Um, Flutter, for example, uses the gotcha system um, and that we use to monetize, and they're all kind of designed on time-based mechanics uh, because all our games you are playing them for a long period of time so they're designed for you to to leave and then come back to the game and keep playing thank you hi so <clears throat> i'm not uh, technically uh, oh not even technically i'm not a student right now uh, but uh, i do have uh, one question because you uh, have done something that most people don't get to do and because most people join a company that already has an established culture, but you actually got to do that journey creating the culture. And so I was just wondering, from when you guys set up to create the culture to now, have you noticed any changes in what you thought uh, one of your values meant? Have they evolved in any way? Or has it say, stayed exactly the same like when you guys set up to do them? we had this vision that we wanted Runaway to be a place uh, where everyone was excited to come to work. So that was kind of the seed where everything grew out from. Um, it wasn't until we, we doubled in size uh, where we actually started to think about the culture. And the way we defined that was um, uh, the process I talked about, the, talking to everyone, having one-on-ones with everybody. We, we did surveys and then we found all these keywords to just really see what was important for the people working there at the time. Um, and since then, it hasn't changed that much. Um, we have added, uh, originally we didn't have um, a diversity as one of our sort of core values, which is something we added a few years ago because we felt like that was important and it was something we naturally did within the company anyway. But it, it hasn't... Um, changed but it's also something like at runaway like we're 30 people now we have a leadership team of four people and every week we talk about um, any sort of change in culture that is happening and we work really proactively with steering it in a way that we are comfortable with and we also ask for feedback from the people working in the company um, every six months to make sure that everybody um, that we are living those brand values. Um, we also have a really open culture um, when it comes to feedback and sharing things within the studio. Like one thing we do is we share all our KPIs, like the, the performance of all our games with everybody in the studio once a week. Um, so we kind of do a lot of work to make sure that people feel like they're involved and know everything that's going on 
with the game and to feel like they can also have an impact on that culture. So it's constant work. Um, and if we didn't do all that work, I'm sure it would change because every new person you add to a project or a team have a chance to derail that culture. <clears throat> hey, I understand. Yeah, well, thank you for the talk. And uh, I kind of found uh, some similarities because uh, from hearing that you you like wanted to do everything because about like game design and uh, things like that. Because I'm a little bit of a jack of all trades as well, or I've felt like that since childhood, basically. And I've always felt the pressure that I, I need to focus on something, but and then. Um, because you don't get the job by not focusing and and there is not enough time to you know pursue everything and be good at everything so i, w I was just thinking how realistic it still is to you know find the kind of job that that could use those kind of you know values of of you being interested in everything and maybe you know working at different things or at least yeah. using the knowledge different things and how valued it is compared to, uh, you know, a more uh, specific knowledge, I guess. Yeah, great question. I think um, 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 if, if you're kind of similar to me and you want to do everything and you enjoy that process, I would definitely try and get jobs uh, with either smaller studios or studios that operate in smaller teams. Um, I think big studios are more focused on like edge competence and having like the right person for the right job. And they usually do hire the top of that specific field while smaller studios don't have that luxury uh, because of its size. And then you, you need to hire people that, you know, have have more all round knowledge. So I think a lot of it uh, depends on the size of the company um, you're applying for. And I know some like for us, we're we're not a big studio, but we're um, thirty people. But we still emulate um, the the idea of small game teams. So like right now, we have four different game teams. So we operate very much like small studios within that. And I, there's a lot of uh, other game companies that are doing mm -hmm. the same, that are a bit bigger. So that's what I would go for. Also, if you're in any type of kind of manager, producer, and uh, leadership role, uh, that's also good. I think for any design, and a little bit about everything because that will make uh, it easier for you to sort of understand who's going to uh, implement your design. So having a wider knowledge of that as a designer is also a really good trait. And uh, just as an example, when we hire at Runaway, uh, it's always a plus if you know a little bit about everything. Just because we are small, we, we can't afford to hire someone that just specifically knows one thing because we move people across teams a lot. So it's healthier for us to have people that are a little bit all round um, than hiring people um, that are very specific in one certain field. I see. Uh, kind of a follow up question because this, at least for me specifically, I'm, I'm, I'm an artist. So um, I'm more looking into more looking more into a concept art, but also like with game design or something, something like that. But uh, I have also thought about these like smaller studios because it seems like a fairly um, natural view when, when you look at like larger uh, amount of roles means smaller studios. But but there is a small c clash with the uh, that the smaller studios can. Uh, in a lot of situations, more students can afford to do what the larger studio does in terms of like creating worlds or things like that, which which can be, for example, the passion that you want to work with. And then there's this clash of um, things you you would love to do, and then you know this kind of thing. Do do you know if there's any kind of possibility or like uh, any kind of way to solve this kind of problem? <laughs> I don't know. I'm confusing myself right now. So, 
No, I get, I get what you mean. I think like, and also like you, you might like to do um, one certain thing, but you can also find like what you find the most fun, maybe in a more narrow field as well. Um, and I think, <clears throat> yeah, I think it, it, it's a hard one. And um, <laughs> I, I think like the, the key point is just to, to keep being honest with yourself and when you do go for jobs, be upfront with what uh, what you want to do and what you are the most interested in doing. And just by doing that, when you will get a job, it might not get it e make it easier to get a job, but the job you will end up getting will be something that you find more rewarding. Um, so it's, um, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, thank you very much. Yeah. Uh, yeah, hi. Um, thanks for coming away. That's very nice to listen to. Nice to listen to as well. Um, I've got a question, couple of questions about working abroad, especially outside of the EU. Because um, like usually competition is high within these jobs, and when when you apply to like a company that's abroad, and again, especially outside the EU, what sort of things can you do to improve your chances to get hired instead of the people that are actually in the country and it's probably less hassle to employ? Like, how did you sort of go, go about that and how do you recommend other people can go about a similar sort of thing? Um, yeah, so the way I got this job is, um, uh, I actually didn't apply for it. I was recommended for the role and um, in New Zealand at the time, they, for example, in New Zealand, they don't really have game educations like Sweden does. So they did have a shortage of um, uh, people with experience of game design and game art and stuff like that. So for me, the reason why I got the job was that I could uh, apply to be a skilled migrant. Um, um, but that meant that they, the company actually had to prove that they couldn't find the talent I provided within their country. Um, so that's one way to approach it is to make sure that you are kind of uh, the top in that field or that you are filling a niche that doesn't currently exist in that country. And I think, I mean, I, I just worked briefly at a studio in Germany before I got that job. So I would say that I was basically fresh out of uni. So it's not like I had tons of experience and I could still do that. Um, but, but, but yeah, that's the way I would approach it now. And I think a lot of countries, uh, like it's good to have uh, make sure you actually graduate and get your certificate because that will also help you through the visa process when you are going for these jobs. Um, but I think going for them, the only thing you can do is just to lead with your competence and, and, and prove why they need you and not someone else. But if I take the example of New Zealand, and I know it's the same in Australia, there is a shortage of talent, especially for senior roles within the game industry. Uh, so they do, um, uh, I know that they work, uh, to, like the New Zealand game industry work together with immigration to try and bring talent. And so there's definitely a need for it in certain mm -hmm. countries. I don't know how it is everywhere in the world, but especially in New Zealand and yeah. Australia, that's the case. Yeah, like America would be a lot hard to get into comparatively, for example. Yes, I, I believe so. Um, but I mean, it is like when I first moved, I, I didn't I didn't have the intention to stay in New Zealand forever or to relocate mm -hmm. my whole life. Um, I was there for a three month contract. So that's also a way to kind of test the field is to um, get kind of a contract work for a specific project for a short period of time. And then sort of my visa kept getting extended. And after working there, um, I became sort of a crucial part for um, uh, the company. So it was harder to replace me, which also made it easier for me to sort of apply for my resident visa and have an excuse to stay. Hmm. Yeah, sure. A lot of things to unpack. Thanks. Thank you.